Uh, Tony Leggett would, would have been the fourth person, so he didn't share the Nobel Prize with us, but he got his own prize for having explained what it was that we discovered, and that was in 2003. Let me go over the strategies. Uh, utilize new technologies to view nature from a new perspective or in a different realm. Don't give up when things are going badly, like when students take away your equipment. Uh, failure might be an invitation to try something new. Uh, spend a little time doing something different. Curiosity-driven research is fun, and it can be rewarding. And this is really for graduate students. Uh, avoid too many commitments. The demands of good research do not adhere to a schedule. I cannot imagine if I had committed to, for instance, being uh, acting in a play or something like that, uh, that, that, that when, when uh, they took away the magnet, I'm sure I would have not continued uh, studying uh, uh, keeping my cryostat cold. So, so I think this is really an important one if you're a, a graduate student. Maybe even if you're an undergraduate student. <laughs> so, and then finally, uh, back off from what you're doing occasionally to gain a better perspective uh, on the task at hand. Now I didn't tell you, it, but, but in fact a squirrel gave its life so that I would make this discovery. Uh, it's, it's a long story, but, but the bottom line is, is that, that that this forced me to warm my cryostat up and when I cooled it back down my cryostat leaked. So I, basically there was a month when I had to repair my cryostat. That was when I went to Michael Fisher and asked him how helium-3 would grow inside a Pomeranchek cell. So you have to back off from what you're doing occasionally and then thinking, think about it fresh and new and, and that's when a lot of your best ideas come. And so then Actually, as soon as I got done, I went directly to AT&T Bell Laboratories. I had a permanent job. It was amazing. The first tenured faculty offer I got, I was less than one year out of graduate study. So some people are lucky, I guess. Anyway, so, so I went to Bell Laboratories, and, and I stayed there studying superfluid helium-3. And in 1977, I would say at that time at Bell Laboratories, good research was research was defined as being research that taught us something new about nature. And, and uh, I had basically, more and more, was, 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 I was measuring numbers. I wasn't discovering new behavior anymore. I was, I was trying to legitimize uh, the discovery of superfluid helium-3, make it maybe more important than it was. And eventually, Joe Burton, who was the director of the Physical Research Laboratory, called me in his, his office, and he said, Douglas, you've now been here five years, and you've done nothing but study superfluidity in helium-3. I swallowed deeply. I didn't like the tone of this. And then he said very gently, don't you think it's time to try something else? And I walked out of his office feeling terrible. I mean, this was, I mean, it was a company. If he, if he said I couldn't study superfluid helium-3, I couldn't study superfluid helium-3. But within about an hour, I started feeling that an enormous weight was lifted from my shoulders. The more and more I was doing incremental research, and he had just given me a hunting license to go out and look for entirely new science. And within two years, uh, I and collaborators at Bell Laboratories had discovered nuclear anti-ferromagnetism in solid helium-3. This is what I was supposed to do for my PhD thesis, but in fact it had never been done. And, and in fact it, the nature of that ordering was very different than one had expected. And then me and another collaborator had discovered something called weak localization in two dimensions. Just so basically within two years of stopping uh, my research and shifting fields. So that's this idea that, that you, you need to change the nature of your research occasionally. So let me talk about strategies that Bell Laboratories change the subject of your research occasionally. After a while, we lose perspective as well as run out of ideas. Note the predictions of theorists. Now, I don't mean this to be uh, 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 critical, but don't trust them to be correct. Theorists have a nose for where interesting physics lies, but we cannot expect them to get all the details correct. That is absolutely correct. So you have to build flexibility into your experiments. And, in, and that's, you know, I was lucky that, that I, I was doing that. And, and finally, uh, collaborate to add additional expertise. In both of these experiments done at Bell Laboratories, I had collaborators. 
particularly with those whose skills complement your own. So I tended to work with, in, in, in the one case, a solid helium-3 with theorists, and then uh, in the case with weak localization, I worked with someone who was an expert at fine line lithography. And so after 24 years, here I am, this is 1996, and you can see that I am also smiling, by the way, <laughs> as, as I accept my Nobel Prize from King Carl Gustav of Sweden. Now, of course, David Lee and Bob Richardson were there as well. We all got the prize, but, but I show this one image because, in fact, I have a lot of trouble with this idea that the Nobel Prize perpetuates. That, that is, that great discoveries are made by individuals working more or less in isolation all by themselves. And I think that's very seldom the case. So if you look at my apparatus now, I've added the names of people who contributed uh, understanding or technologies that were essential uh, for this discovery. So Block and Purcell for their invention of NMR, even my thermometry was done using NMR. Uh, Edwards and Hall for their work that led to the development of the dilution refrigerator, which we used to pre-cool the helium-3 down to these very low temperatures. Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer for their three theory of superconductivity. Anderson uh, for his realization that, in fact, this, this might uh, actually explain uh, spin order, uh, 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 superfluidity in, in helium-3. Pomeranchuk for his proposal back in 19. 50, Hamill, Wheatley, Landau, Strady, Adams. I could have probably added at least another factor of two more names than this. But the fact is that, that, that this research relied on many, many other people and many other developments. And so let me end by saying that advances in science are seldom made by individuals alone. They result from the progress of the scientific community, asking questions, developing new technologies to answer those questions and sharing their results and their ideas with others. To have rapid progress, one must support scientific research broadly and encourage scientists to interact with one another to spend a bit of their time satisfying their own curiosities. This is how advances in science are made. Thank you. I guess I'll come over here. Well, I, I must confess I was going to tell you something else, but after all that applause, I've completely forgotten. <laughs> Maybe I'll remember later. Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Douglas Oshroff. Muchas gracias por su presentación, Dr. Oshroff. Continuando con el programa de este día, presento al señor Gerardo David Abreu Pedersini, estudiante de la licenciatura en física de la Universidad de las Américas Puebla y coordinador de la conferencia Nobel Otoño 2008. Gracias. Eh, buenas tardes a todos. Eh, quiero saludar primero que nada hoy eh, con mucho gusto al doctor Douglas Osseroff y al ingeniero Cuauhtémoc Cárdenas, a quienes les agradezco profundamente que hayan aceptado la invitación a estar con nosotros el día de hoy. Y saludo asimismo al doctor Luis Ernesto Berbés y al doctor José Loyola. Y aprovecho para agradecer a esta nueva administración de la UDLA todo el apoyo que nos han brindado. Ante todo... Eh, quisiera en este breve mensaje también agradecer a los invitados especiales que nos acompañan, 